uh, that's good timing with the crops, and I know farmers were so desperate for some of that. So it's great to have a refreshing rain today. Um, as you note, uh, most of you probably noted you were able to go ahead and use um, the east door. That project has been completed. We have a, a, a non-skid surface that's been put on that rather than uh, indoor-outdoor carpet. So thanks, uh, Tom, for making sure that happens. It looks very nice, and you won't have to worry about slipping or sliding, okay? It's, as you can tell, it's a little abrasive. So that'll help us. So thanks uh, for getting that uh, done. So we'll make sure that we uh, get that announcement out of here. Uh, check out the lawn mowing list. I think uh, maybe somebody is needed for July. You can talk to Tom about that. If you want to volunteer somebody else, that'd be okay too. So, and then just call them and tell them you vol volunteered them for mowing. So, um, Keep that in mind. In July, uh, we will move our regular communion Sunday since July 4th falls on Sunday. Um, we'll move our uh, communion Sunday to the 11th. And on the 4th, if you'd like to wear uh, multiple colors, um, red, white, or blue, or any combination thereof, uh, feel free to do that. Take a look at the uh, sign-up sheets for uh, Liturgist Reader, and uh, also I think that we're off to a good start on our sign-up for fellowship time, so uh, look out ahead there on that, and if you can plug in a time that you're willing to help. Uh, thanks today for uh, um, the ladies that are helping us with that and providing refreshments from week to week. Thanks, everybody, for getting that back in fellowship. We'll make sure we put out, I think we've got a few more tables out today, so we'll have a little more space uh, to move everybody around. All right, well, let's uh, stand together, and uh, hymn number 110 is our opening hymn. Oh, 
Let us pray. Lord, we have come this day seeking your presence and healing love. Be with us as we hear the words of hope and compassion. Give us courage to learn and grow that we might serve you faithfully all of our days. Amen. The love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. God's love for us is great. God is like a loving parent who watches over us. God's mercy for us is great. God reaches out to us in healing, patience, and peace. Praise be to God who has called us here. Praise be to God whose love and mercy is given to us. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for the promise of your presence. You call us to be part of your new creation. Loving Christ, we celebrate your call to join you in God's new creation. Remind us to continue to faithfully work for good with gratitude for the many blessings you have poured upon us. Come fill us now as we gather to share and worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. You may be seated. So I think everyone knows, or you will be reminded that today is Father's Day. Did anybody remember that today? Okay, it's a good day to reach out to your father or um, someone who is a father figure in your life. Um, and some of us have uh, fathers who are still living, some are deceased, but um, this is a wonderful day to acknowledge the influence of fathers uh, on our life. We had Mother's Day about uh, a month ago or so, wasn't it? So here we are coming up with Father's Day. So man, let's let you be honored today and acknowledged by standing, okay? So do that now and you ladies and children, um, let's give them a good love applause. Let's celebrate our fathers today, okay? Very good. We've got a good group of men here. And I guess if we wanted to take the time, we could all have them tell the best father story they know. But uh, we might be here a while, but we are blessed. Uh, my own father is deceased, um, so I acknowledge him always with uh, the heritage that I have. Uh, preacher father, pastor father. Um, and then my mother was able to remarry five or six years later, and so I have a a second father who's actually been in my life longer than my own biological father was. Um, so um, I'm blessed uh, to have two influences in my life that way, and maybe some of you are that way as well, but certainly um, a wonderful way to just remember uh, the influence of those who were in our lives and who uh, brought us to where we are. So I want to just offer a, a prayer right now before we sing a chorus together just to Give thanks uh, to you, our fathers. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks today for uh, fathers who showed up in our lives, um, who taught us, and uh, who we were able to learn from. Thank you for fathers who were able to hold us in strong arms when we were weak, fathers who believed in us and trusted us with our own futures, even as they taught us how best to live. Thank you for fathers who exhibited the best of what it means to be a father in favor of strength and love and empathy. Thank you for fathers who had high standards yet had deep compassion for their family. Thank you for fathers who taught us rules, principles, guidelines to live by and for fathers who with integrity were able to live by those principles themselves. We thank you for the protection of our fathers who did protect us, protected our families, and sought after our welfare. And we thank you for fathers who were never related to us by blood or by law, but stood in as a father figure in so many families' lives. We thank you for fathers who were not always present, but by grace came back into the lives of their families. We are truly blessed 
by the role models that we have in our life and in our families. So Lord, we give you thanks. We acknowledge the presence of those who are here today. Lord, I pray you would bless them, give them strength, those who are still bringing up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Help them to be good leaders in their home, to be good examples in their home of the love that Christ has for the church. For those uh, who are empty nest fathers whose children have now uh, gone from home and uh, many of those fathers have become grandfathers, thank you for their steady and strong influence in the lives of grandchildren. And for those who have a father figure in their life, maybe who were never blessed with a loving or caring or leading father in their home, but took on someone else as a father figure, as a role model in their lives, we thank you for those influences and we are truly blessed. So remind us of our heavenly father who loves us with an everlasting love, who forgives us, who cares for us, who nurtures us, and who leads us into life everlasting. For all of this, O oh Lord, we give you praise and thanksgiving. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together our chorus. You will find it um, in your insert. We're going to run back through this from last week. So if you'd stand, please. Oh, how he loves you and me. Now, I think last week maybe some of you had a one version um, edition of this, or one verse edition, and some had a two verse. I had a two verse. I don't know what you have, but the first verse you should have, oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. Now, if you have the second verse, how many second verses do we have? Oh, we're, we're better this week, so we'll be able to complete this. Now, if you don't, Maybe you can look over somebody's shoulder or step in close. But the second line says, Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for sinners to show. What he did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you and me. So I think we have enough who have the second verse that we'll be able to do it in full this morning. So let's sing this together, shall we? Which they made. 
their own good is cut off in the day of the shade. The Lord has made known. The Lord has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall depart from Sheol, all the nations that forgot God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are mortal. take time for prayer this morning and as we're praying be mindful of our needs before us um, we've tried to update a little bit the uh, prayer list that's in your worship folder so uh, take a look at that this morning um, the family of Lowell Noring found out um, after the service that he had passed so let's remember um, Lowell's uh, family in prayer as we are uh, thinking of praying for those who are in need you have some joys or uh, concerns that you'd like to share this morning by way of update or anything new that we need to know about. Let's pray together. Father, you are good to us and we're reminded uh, through your word that uh, all the nations, all the peoples uh, praise you. And we've been reminded through our scene this morning that we have this mighty fortress in our God, a bulwark that never fails us, that stands strong always for us and with us. And we know that you did love us, Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for sinners to show. And what you did there brought hope from despair. We know that you do love us, each of us. Oh, how he loves you and me. And we're here this morning because of that love and we give you thanks. We know we are abundantly blessed, more than we deserve. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the gifts of your blessings, the gift of your love, peace, joy, and we stand forgiven uh, in your name and because of your grace. So we uh, pause this morning and just give joy for the blessings that we share. We count our blessings. We name them one by one. Lord, we know that anything that we have, any gift, any blessing we have, comes because of your good favor in our lives. And we do thank you for that today. And while we express our gratitude for our joys, uh, we also, O oh Lord, um, remember those who are in need today, our concerns, uh, our cares, and our burdens. Some of those we carry individually and others of those needs we uh, carry together. So we're glad that whatever that need is, uh, you come alongside us with your Holy Spirit and you comfort us in all of our sorrows. You strengthen us in all of our weakness. Uh, you help us to rise above and through our difficulties. Lord, uh, we just extend our hands and receive um, those uh, requests, those um, answers to our prayers as well. 
Lord, we know that you are able to do more than we could ever ask or think. And that's a wonderful promise to us because we know that there are things in our lives that seem impossible, that seem insurmountable, but you, O oh Lord, open the doors. You make a way where there doesn't seem to be any way. And so, Lord, we claim the promise of your word that we can pass all of our cares upon you because you care for us. And then you've told us when we do that, we can draw near to God and you will draw near to us. So draw near to all of those who need the nearness of your presence and who need to know your love, who need to experience your love, who need to know your forgiveness. And Lord, uh, we know that you truly are able to do more than we could ever think or ask. So Lord, we uh, keep on seeking, we keep on asking, and we keep on knocking. We have this promise that the doors will be open to us. So open the doors in our lives that need to be open, close the doors that need to be closed, and help us, O oh Lord, to follow you closely with sincere hearts, with a fervent love one toward another, to know that you will be with us. You are Emmanuel, God with us. So we give you this day, we thank you for the refreshing rain on the earth in this part of Iowa. I trust that it's uh, reaching all around this state that has been so uh, driven by drought over the last uh, several months, it seems. So Lord, we just really are grateful for the rain. We know that the crops are, are drinking up the water that you send. And Lord, uh, this helps to have a harvest, a abundant harvest for farmers that depend on this for their livelihood. Lord, I just thank you for, uh, for these gifts of creation. The sun that shines, uh, the water that falls, um, and Lord, the growth that takes place. Lord, we just uh, thank you and remind us always that we are so dependent upon you. We are so dependent upon you. And when we know we're dependent upon you, uh, when you give us these blessings, help us always to be quick and ready uh, to give you thanks. And we, we do that today. So Lord, in this service, as we uh, look into your word, um, Lord, we know that you have something to say to us today that will Help us to live our lives in these difficult days and to know that we can continue to walk with you as you've promised to walk with us and be with us. And we thank you. We, we pray this prayer, O oh Lord, and the prayers that these here today, our sisters and brothers in Christ, have offered up to you in the quiet of their heart. We offer these prayers to you, and we do it in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your giving. We've left the plates on the back table still, so um, as you're leaving today, if you haven't given, I encourage you to do that. Thank you for uh, just your faithfulness and making sure the needs are supplied from week to week, and the Lord will be with you and bless you uh, for your giving. Now, we'll hear the reading of the Word this morning. Um, in your bulletins, it says verse 7 through 22. If you've looked at the Bible, there is no up to verse 22 in chapter 4. So it actually is verses 7 through 11, okay? 7 through 11. I was prepared to add to it. So you, were, to you were just going to take over. Well, my idea about that would be if you add any verses, you preach on those verses, okay? So, all right. 7 through 11, thank you. All right, this is on page 218 in your pew hymnal, 1 Peter Chapter 4, beginning verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, keep sane and sober for your prayers. 
Above all, hold on failing your love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. Practice hospitality ungrudgingly to one another. As each has received a gift, employ it for one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who utters oracles of God, whoever renders service as one who renders in by the strength which God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or a wrongdoer or a mischief maker, mischief maker. Yet, if one suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But under that name, let him glorify God. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what would be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous man is scarcely saved, where will the impious and sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will do right and entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Here ends chapter 4 of 1 Peter. So, um, we are obviously in this last uh, section of chapter 4 and as you heard in the reading uh, there's a section in this chapter um, that is about suffering and uh, that's the part that we heard read this morning in verses 12 through 19. We have talked about suffering in several messages so that is, in fact, one of the themes, as we have identified of 1 Peter. We know the context of the scripture, Roman Empire, uh, Jewish Christians are being persecuted for their faith. So uh, Peter is reminding them throughout this book about standing strong, standing firm, not wavering in your faith, having a living and joyful hope, don't give in um, because the times are difficult, but you can have real life and your real life comes uh, through serving Jesus. So um, that section has a lot of things to say about suffering in a little different dimension. Um, and again, uh, if you just look down through that paragraph, He's just saying, you know, don't be surprised when you have a fiery trial. It shouldn't catch you by surprise. It's, it's going to happen. Don't think that it's something unusual. It's, it goes with the territory, sort of the, the contemporary idiom. And, and then he just reminds them again, as he has in several other places, when you go through suffering, rejoice, because Jesus suffered also. So you're sharing in his sufferings. He suffered for you. You'll suffer for him. Um, and he says that the reason that's going to happen is because um, you're going to have great joy. Someday you're going to rejoice with great joy. And the sufferings of this life, the, the difficult things we go through in this life are going to pale in comparison to the joy that we experience in heaven. So everything that happens to us here is but temporary. It doesn't last forever. It's not going to go on the rest of your life. Um, there's another place. There's another place that we're journeying to. So this is really this common undergirding foundational theme in 1 Peter. And then he brings up this subject again that there will be others who will ridicule you for your faith. 
um, they won't like it because you serve Christ. And he says, if that happens, if you're ridiculed, if you're persecuted for your Christian faith, then you're blessed because the favor of God is upon you. Have you ever thought of that? That if you're persecuted, if, if you're ridiculed because of the name of Christ, that that's the favor of God on you. We, we might look at that as disfavor, like, oh, somehow we're missing something. Like, why would I be going through this if I'm serving Christ? Why would I go through this? But that's just the opposite. When you share in the sufferings of Christ, it's the favor of God upon you. And uh, he says that if you're going to suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But glorify God in having the name Christian. Glorify God that you are called to be a Christ one. So he's just really re-emphasizing this whole thing about live a hopeful life, live a joyful life, live a firm life, live a life with foundations, even in difficult times when things don't go your way. Now, that's the last part of this chapter. I want us to back up and talk about another theme that is here, and this is found in verses 7 through 11. So he introduces some familiar themes, but he also reemphasizes some things that we have already heard from 1 Peter. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Now, my particular Bible, as I've told you, and maybe your Bible does too, if you have your own personal Bible here, has paragraph headings. And that always helps me to sort of break up a chapter, break up a book. I can kind of see the different themes. And that's what I've been choosing to do based on my Bible. Um, the paragraph heading that I have here in mind is end time ethics, end time ethics. So I'm framing this this morning as a call to end time ethics. Now, verses 12 through 19, as I just briefly summarized for you, uh, my paragraph heading is Christian suffering. So that would be another call, another reminder to Christian suffering. But I want us to look at these practical little um, instructions, practical exhortations found in verse 7 through 11. Now, the focus here that Peter has for us is on how we should live our lives. I think I've told you before that living lives different from the world around us should not be mysterious. Peter is making it clear. The fact that you come across as different because you're a follower of Christ, the fact that that happens and that somebody might ridicule for that, for you for that, that should not be mysterious. It should not, it should not be a mystery to you. It, it should just, you should just realize that that comes with following Christ. Somebody may not like the way you present something. Somebody may not like the way you preach something or the way you teach something and you're seeking to follow God's word. There's a variety of things that can happen to us that can make us feel like that somehow that, that's a mysterious thing that's happening to us. When in reality it says it's really not a mystery. You should just know that this is going to happen. So you live your life differently. Well, how do we do that? What instruction do we have that tells us we should live our lives different. What does that look like for us? And so in these verses, in these few short verses, we're told what is to characterize our lives. And he begins this section, if you'll notice in verse seven, just follow along in your Bible. He says, the end of all things is near. So he says there is an end time coming. And because of that, you need to live in a way that's worthy of the kingdom of God. That should be our primary purpose. So the question is, how do we live lives 
that bring glory to God? What do we need to have in our lives if we're going to bring glory to God? You've heard me say, and there are those of you who will testify personally, that whatever you do, you want to bring glory to God. Well, what does that look like? What does it mean when we say, I want to bring glory to God? Well, we have here in this paragraph what that means. And I want to frame it in two broad categories, two main points, and I want to expand on each of those. The first one is, we want to bring glory to God. We should have an expectant attitude toward Christ. An expectant attitude toward Christ. And then secondly, we should have a fervent attitude toward the family of God. So an expectant attitude toward Christ and a fervent attitude toward our sisters and brothers in Christ. Now let's go back and look at that first one. Let's look at what kind of an attitude should we have toward Christ. And we'll find this one primarily in verse 7. Christians in the early church expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. The fact that he did not return in their lifetime does not invalidate the promise of his coming. We have these words, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. So it sounds like from this verse that if you had heard this letter read in your church on a Sunday and the reader of the letter, and you know that these were letters to the churches, this was a letter from Peter to the Jewish Christians and was read in the various places where they worshiped, house churches or wherever, they would go in, it would circulate these letters because nobody had written copies. So somebody had a written copy, but they couldn't duplicate it. So they would literally go into a setting and they would read this entire letter. So it'd be much like I have a letter from Peter to read to you today. And obviously over time we know that these letters were included in the, the canon of Holy Scripture. They were included as inspired words of God. So you can just imagine that if you, for the first time, heard the letter of Peter read to you in your assembly, and you heard these words, the end of all things is near, you might wonder what that was about. Now, based on other letters that they had heard, they knew that Christ would return, Christ would come again. Well, we know now we're far removed from the original reading of the letters, and we're still here, aren't we? And Christ has not come. So what I'd like to submit to you, that because of that, the real emphasis here, the real emphasis when we see these words, be sober or be alert, it reminds us that whenever the end is to come, we should live with expectancy. In other words, we should be ready, we should be prepared, we should be alert, so that whenever Christ chooses to come, whenever that end is near to us, we are ready. So I remember my father used to always say when he was talking about the coming of Christ, like, when is Jesus going to come again? Well, Jesus said, nobody knows the day nor the hour. So what do we do with that? Because I grew up, when I was a child, 10, 11, 12 years old, I heard preachers get up and say, Jesus is coming again. He's going to come again. He's going to receive us. Those who are dead, believers are going to be resurrected, new bodies. Those of us who are alive, when Jesus comes, we're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's right from God's word. 
So when I was growing up as a child, I heard Jesus is coming again. And I also heard this, Jesus is coming soon. And I remember thinking many times, oh, what if Jesus would come tonight? Would I be ready? Did anybody ever have that thought? What if he came tonight? Would I be ready? And then I would hear preachers talk about the words of Jesus when it says, you know, two shall be working in the field. One will, one will be left behind. One will be taken. Or two will be sleeping in a bed. One will be taken, the other left behind. And Jesus was talking about some will make it and some won't. And you need to be ready. And Jesus always termed it in the context of be ready, always expecting, always be prepared. You don't know when he's going to come. Well, I grew up hearing that Jesus is coming soon. Well, now I'm 50 some years later from the age of 12. And guess what I'm telling you this morning? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. The end is near. So what I'd like to suggest to you, um, and this isn't very profound, but the end is nearer than it ever was. How about that? My father always said this. He said, live as if Jesus were coming today, but plan as if he were not coming for a hundred years. I like that. So when you get up every day, you need to live your life as if Jesus is coming today. But remember this, he doesn't expect us to sit down and do nothing. He expects us to be prepared. So we live our lives in preparation. We go ahead and prepare for today and we prepare for tomorrow. How many of you have plans for this week? Anybody got any plans for this week? Okay, you have things you wanna get done. What if I stood up here and told you, oh, you don't need to worry about that, Jesus is coming, just forget it. That's not what he's calling us to do. He's not calling us to be lazy. He's not calling us to be indifferent. He's not calling us to be a reckless dreamer. He's not calling us to be a zealous fanatic. There are a lot of people out there, and I would just remind you of this, who try to give every possible interpretation they can to where we are in the stage of time. There's all kinds of what I call prophetic utterances. There's all kinds of people who try to dissect every word in the book of Revelation and want to tell you the color of the toenail of the angel that dances on the head of the pen. They think they have it that clear. But what I want to tell you is um, Jesus just made sure he didn't get into the details. He did give us some framework. He talked about wars and plagues and pestilences and and people falling away from Christ. He gave us enough to understand that we could live in a season when we could expect the coming of the Lord. And Jesus said, as my coming is delayed, as I delay my coming, things will get worse and worse. People will wax worse and worse. Evil will get worse and worse. So we know what's happening in the season of time. We just don't know the day nor the hour, and nobody can predict that. So what the lesson for us is, is that whenever the end comes, okay, whenever that is, we really don't need to worry about that if we are what? If we are ready. If, if, if we do what we say, we have our bags packed and we're ready to go. If you know the plane is going to leave, you don't wait till after the plane leaves to get ready, do you? You get ready probably more than an hour ahead of time. Most of us, if we're taking a big trip, we get out our suitcase and what do we do? We start putting things in it. So those of senior minds like myself don't forget something important. And it never fails. 
Even when I think that I have it all in the suitcase, it's all packed and ready to go, what happens? I get there and I forgot my toothbrush. <laughs> Pretty basic, isn't it? Or some other basic thing. It's really easy to do that. And so it just reminds us that we as Christians, okay, when we get up Monday morning, we should be able to say, Lord Jesus, if this is the day you choose to come, my suitcase is packed and I'm ready to go. Don't you think that'd be a good way to live? But if you don't come, I'm going to go back to bed and sleep till you do come. <clears throat> not going to work that way, is it? Now, we might feel like doing that, but that's not going to get anything done. Because there's another thing that Jesus said. He said in the Gospels, occupy till I come. <laughs> I'm going to come. But you keep busy doing the master's work. You keep busy living your life for Jesus. Don't give up. Just have your suitcase packed. Have it ready so that when I come, you're ready to go. And while you're waiting on me, be alert. Be sober-minded. Now, if you want to just look through this whole paragraph, there are several things that we could say that Peter gives us to keep our lives in balance. Now, we're going to move into that second part. I'm talking right now about this expected attitude toward Christ. We expect Him to come, but we're going to live our lives in preparation. We're going to be ready when He comes. Whatever that means in our lives, we're going to be ready. Now, in all of these verses, He tells us how we can be ready. Every verse has something about that. So it's what I call the Ten Commandments for the Lord's return, okay? Simple phrases. So if you got your Bible, look at verse 7. First commandment, be sober. Be sober. That means be discerning. Have wisdom. Be able to understand the times that we're living in and what's going on. Be mindful around you. Then the second commandment in verse 7 is be prayerful. Watch unto prayer. That's the second commandment. So sober, prayerful. Verse 8, have fervent love. That's commandment number 3. Have a fervent love. You see that? Maintain constant love. Verse 4, or verse 9, I'm sorry, commandment 4, verse 9. Use hospitality. Be hospitable to one another. And a little sideline, a little addendum to that fourth commandment is don't complain. Commandment 5 in verses 10 and 11 is minister with your spiritual gifts. Notice, everybody's received a gift. And he says in verse 10, use that to serve others. Don't put it on the shelf. <laughs> Christ is coming. That's true. But don't be idle. Use what gift you've been given. Use it to serve others in the body of Christ. Verse 6. I'm sorry. Commandment 6, verse 12. This is where we go over into the second section now that we just briefly alluded to at the beginning of the message. He says... Don't think it's strange for trials. So this sixth commandment is, don't think that trials are strange. You're going to have them. Verse 13, here's a simple command. Seven, rejoice. Rejoice, always rejoice. Then if you go to verses 15 and 16, the eighth commandment is, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of Christ. And then verses 16 through 18, commandment number nine is glorify God. And then in verse 19, commandment 10, commit yourself to God. Entrust yourself to a faithful creator while you're doing what is good. So you want to know how to live? You want to know how to live? You just got another set of 10 commandments. These are the New Testament Ten Commandments. Be sober. Keep your mind steady and clear. 
Don't be in a frenzy. Don't be off on some tangent or some new interpretation of Scripture. Just be faithful to what God has called to be. And this letter that Peter gives us is full of hope. So live your life in joyful hope. Don't be a sad Christian. Actually, some of us need to put a smile on our face and tell our face we have a smile. Be a joyful Christian. Don't be a gloomy Christian. Yeah, things are difficult. Things aren't always going the way we want them to, but our lives should be full of hope and joy. Why? Why should we be full of jo joy and hope? You tell me, why should we? Because we know that Christ is going to come. So let's just live ready for that. Have your suitcase ready, okay? So, if it's by the end of the day, fine. If it's tomorrow, maybe it's five years, it doesn't matter. If we're ready, if we're expecting, if we're alert, if we're praying, if we're doing what God has called us to do, if we're occupying till he comes, then I would just suggest to you we're going to be okay. And that's what Peter's telling us. Well, let's move to that uh, second thought, shall we? This fervent attitude toward sisters and brothers in Christ. This is verses 8 through 11. What does he say? Well, he's talking about our love. So he talks about different dimensions of our love. He says, first of all, your love should be fervent. What does the word fervent mean? Well, he uses a word here that really comes from the world of athletics. It's a word that means um, an athlete that is straining to reach the goal. They're trying to get to the end line. Last night, I don't know, I think my wife was paying a little bit of attention. The TV was on and I was watching the Olympic trials. And I love watching the men's and women's races. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They have these 800 meters, these 400 meters, they have the 100 meters. And it's just so fascinating to watch everybody come off the line at the same time. And then those runners, as that race gets longer and longer, see for me, if it's 800 meters, I would start out fast and end up slow. But you know what they do? They are blazing. The last 200 meters, it's like they turn on a jet engine in their body and they actually are running faster the last 100 meters than they were the 700. I actually, I'd be laying on the, I'd be laying on the track is where I'd be laying. But they, it's just like they go into another gear. And why are they doing that? They're straining with all fervency. They're trying to get to the finish line. And they're running literally neck and neck, shoulder to shoulder. And the closer somebody gets to them, does it make them slow down and say, oh, I'm going to give up. They're going to pass me. No. When they get close, what do they do? They, like if they've got another gear, they kick it in and it's just like you can almost see them. They're just like their hands are going and their feet are going. They're in this perfect rhythm and they're just, and I love the slow motion. When they play the slow motion, you see the slow motion? Like every part of their body, their cheeks are bulging, their chest is bulging, and their legs are straining and their arms are moving. They're, I mean, they are literally straining to reach the goal. Now, Peter says, your love should be that same kind of love. You should have such intense, fervent love for the brothers and sisters in Christ that you are straining. You are, you are fervently trying to get to the goal. That's your passion intensity, eagerness. So when you're seeking to love in that way, that's not just feeling like it. It's a matter of will. They don't just get out on track and say, well, I feel like I'm going to make it to the end. Like, I feel like if I get out here and run, I'll win. No, it's a matter of their will. They decide, I'm going to win this race. I'm going to do it with everything in me. And he says, when you're in the family of God, with everything within you, love one another. Do it with intensity. Do it with fervency. And you treat and love others the way God does you. And then he says that Christian love is forgiving. Notice it covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean that you condone sin. 
what he says. Because if you love somebody, if you truly love somebody, you're going to be grieved to see them sin and hurt themselves and others. But what he says is this, that love covers sin. It covers a multitude of sins in that love motivates us to hide the sin from others and not spread it around. So if somebody's sinning, you don't go around telling everybody else what they're doing. You, with compassion and understanding, reach out to them in this fervent love to try to bring them to Christ. It's not hating them. You're just simply trying to understand they are without Christ. And they have a multitude of sins. And it's not up to me to let everybody know that. What I need to do is have this fervent love that is practical and intense and reaches out to them, not in hatred, not in malice, but in loving compassion so that I can bring them to Christ through the love that I show them as Christ has shown me love for my sins, my multitude of sins, that I'm able to express that same love. Our love should be practical. Notice now verse 9, he says you're to be hospitable. And that basically means you share your home with others, you're generous, you don't complain, oh, I really wish we weren't having them over today. This is such a bore. I really regret that I ever asked them to come over. I mean, really, like, why did we do this? I mean, we planned this a month ago and now they're coming over to our house. Could we just cancel them? That would be sort of a complaining sort of way. And please don't tell me if you think that way about me, okay? Just don't let me know that. Just go ahead. I come over and you're just hospitable and nice. You know what I mean here. Be hospitable. Have a spirit of hospitality, of, of kindness, of reaching out. Now, the reason that he said this is because back in the day when this was written, there weren't Super 8s and Motel 6 and Ramada Inn and Holiday Inn Express. They didn't have stuff like that. In fact, inns, lodging inns, were very rare, if any. What happened was people stayed in other people's homes especially poor Christians couldn't afford to stay at a place if it did make some men on the chart. We know there were inns because of the Good Samaritan story who took somebody to an inn and paid the innkeeper, we know, but not everybody could afford those. So there was always a spirit of hospitality. So when you have a home and it's available, open it up to others in a spirit of love and grace. Be practical in your love. You can extend the hand. A uh, good example of that is our neighbor who lives across the street from us, um, whose wife died on Easter Sunday morning this year. We had a little tree planting ceremony in his yard in her memory. All the neighbors got together and you know put some money in, got a, got a tree, and we had a tree planting ceremony. But anyway, yeah, he's now uh, living in a large house across the street from us by himself, and it was kind of interesting. Here's this wonderful person who all the neighbors love. His wife is now deceased. And, and he said this at the end, kind of in a neighborly way. He said, I have seven bedrooms, right? I have seven bedrooms in my house. He said, I have more house than I need. He said, so if any of you ever have any visitors or company and you need some extra rooms, he said, please let me know. I would be glad to share six rooms on my own. And I spoke up to Joe and I said, I have 16 grandchildren. When they come, we can put them all over there. I can't accommodate them all at one time. And he actually, you know what he said? He said, that'd be great. I'm sure he'd love the company. Maybe. I don't know. 16 grandchildren. Uh, that'd be a riot. Okay. But the idea behind it is that, I mean, that's neighborly. So this is really just talking about be a good neighbor. Be neighborly. Uh, be hospitable. Uh, if you can open up your home, Open it up. Well, um, having said that, then he says that finally our love has to result in service. You will serve if you love. You have a spiritual gift. God has given you something to use, a talent, a gift, an ability. Use it for the glory of God and the building up of the church. Notice in verse 10, everybody's received a gift. Use it. To serve others. We're all called to serve. 
And so having said that, he ends then in verse 11. He said, if anybody speaks, speak God's words. And if you serve, serve out of the strength that God provides. And the reason we speak God's word. So when I get up here, I want to make sure that I speak the words of God. And then whenever I serve, I want to make sure I'm serving through not my own strength, but his strength that's given to me. And he says this, the reason you do that, look at the last part of verse 11. He says, the reason you do this is so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. So in everything you do, how do you glorify God? Well, if you listen into the whole message, you should know how to do that now. Have an expectant attitude toward Christ and have a fervent love toward our sisters and brothers in Christ. And when we do that, we will do the will of God. Amen and amen. Let's go in that strength today. And let's sing now as our closing hymn, a wonderful hymn to remind us that he has touched us when we reach out.